hello, everybody. Uh, I may introduce myself. I'm Vogelin Jungmann, teaching Korean art history at UCLA, which means that I'm a little bit more east of Dunhuang, a little bit further away. However, Dunhuang has played quite a role in my own studies and training from early on. And I was, uh, I'm, I'm very honored, and it's a great, great pleasure to, to be uh, here and to be able to introduce this panel on Dunhuang East and West. And of course, uh, it's just a wonderful project. I was especially thrilled to uh, see the Diamond Sutra, the earliest known woodblock print in the world, which has kind of accompanied me through my student and later life. Um, and to have all these treasures here in one place is in, in Los Angeles is just great. So uh, my thanks also to all the supporters and organizers of this project. Um, I would like to introduce for our first speaker, who is Valérie Zaleski, uh, who is a curator of Buddhist art uh, from China and Central Asia at the Musée Guimet in Paris. And uh, she will talk to us about, uh, or her talk actually has the title, Toward an Identification of Some Bodhisattvas in Monk's Robes in Paintings from Dunhuang. Please welcome Valérie Zaleski. So I would like first to thank the Getty and, and the organizer of the symposium and the nice exhibition uh, and thanking them for being there on my behalf. So uh, my topic today <laughs> will be very specific, especially compared uh, to the previous subjects. <laughs> So, among the paintings from the manuscript caves in Dunhuang, there are three images, two painted on silk. Okay. Among the paintings from the manuscript cave in Dunhuang, there are three images, two painted on silk, banners, and one on paper, preserved in the Musée Guimet and in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, which have been identified as Bodhisattva images without further precision, as many of this kind of paintings, difficult to identify precisely without the help of any inscription inside the labels. The three figures are, cla <clears throat> the three figures are clad as monks, but wear a crown, and sometimes jewels, and their long hair are partly uh, tied in bun as Bodhisattva's hairdress. They might have, uh, they might that be Kshitigarbha, the song Bodhisattva, which is commonly depicted on banners from Dunhuang, wearing a monk's cloak and jewels. Sorry for, <laughs> but those three have not been identified as the song, as they differ from its Dunhuang images by the presence of a crown instead of the monk's shaved head usually depicted for this figure, and because of the absence of any specific object attributed to this deity. Jewel, Chintamani, and Mandinkan staff, Kakara, though sometimes he holds only a water flask, as for instance, here in, uh, the, in, in, in the National Museum of New Delhi. They also appear different from another type, not precisely identified yet, with monk's garb and jewels, but with a bodhisattva's diadem instead of a crown. This leads to wonder which deity they might represent, as the type of crown and the monk's cloak is not that of unspecified bodhisattva. Apart... Sorry. <coughs> Apart from, <laughs> no. Okay. 
I, I, I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Apart from the hybrid aspect of monk bodhisattva, one is holding a vase with lustral water, kamandalu, and both were a three-pointed crown of either Indian or Central Asian type. Indeed, on these images, the crown, rather than being a diadem with roundels, has either the shape of a goldsmithery retire with three Indian-type high fin finials, as known on a group of Cotonese-style ban banners. You have two here. Or it looks like a three-faceted crown, well known on painted images of the Lokapala presiding to the north, and a protector to Khotan, Vaishwarvana, where a Central Asian influence has been noticed. You have many examples here. But in both cases, but in both cases, as we may surmise, either by the presence of two additional smaller ornaments or by the five jewels placed at the top of the three points and at its immediate spots. I have to go back. You see it here. Oh, I'm afraid. Here. And. Here, here. Um, the crowns may also be related to crowns with five elements devoted to jinas or Dhyani Buddhas, well known in Dunhuang by a few items in paper. Apart from images of Aishravana, this type of three or five pointed crown appears on images of Bodhisattva Maitreya from Central Asia, on sixth century pieces from Khotan, and on a stamp from Duldur Ak Akur. On the other hand, the three-faceted or three-sectioned crown reminds as well the three-fold spreading late Northern Way type found frequently in Longman and in some dated way images of Maitreya. It is also the same type of crown which is worn by later images depicting bejeweled Buddhas from Karakoto, one dating from the 13th century and modeled in clay, the other one dating from the Sorry for that. <clears throat> the other one dating from the 14th century and painted on silk. The issue of the identification of these two bejeweled Buddha images from Karakoto has been questioned, leading to consider that this figure was popular among Tanguts and Mongols. We may note that there, is, uh, there are also several images of Maitreya painted on stucco or on silk and one embroidered from the same period and the same sites. The crown Buddha painted on silk has the hair of a bodhisattva and a depiction in his right hand palm of a coin from the last emperor of the northern Yuan dynasty, Tian Yuan, whose capital city was Karakoto. Though probably aiming at showing supreme generosity of the fulfiller of wishes, the paradoxical presence of such a sign of mundane world on an image of a bejeweled Buddha has been noticed. Furthermore, this coin might simply place this painting in a historical context with the will to associate the Emperor Tian Yuan with the bejeweled Buddha as a Chakravartin, and thus to identify Tian Yuan with the Chakravartin. The unusual style of this painting among the scrolls from Karakoto has been pointed out. Indeed, this image, rather than showing Sinicized or Tibetan characters, Sorry. Uh, Sinicized or Tibetan characters has a Central Asian flavor, as well as some features reminiscent of some Dunhuang paintings, though somewhat stiffened. They're noticeable in the depiction of the garment and the lotus, in features of the faces, and even in the locks of hair around the ears. So. So this type of crown seems to have been significant in Central Asia, apart from the depictions of Vaishravana, for two types of Buddhist images, that is Bodhisattva Maitreya and the Bejeweled Buddha. 
Would it, then, would it be then possible that the bejeweled monk from figures from Dunhuang would be related to one or the other of those figures? In Dunhuang, bejeweled Buddha images are known on the iconographic painting images from the Stein Collection, the part in New Delhi National Museum, depicting famous Buddhist images, which shows four of them. Among these four images of bejeweled Buddha, one is wearing a three-pointed crown, Oops. Yeah. A three-pointed crown, um, but and and he's, he's not named by his inscription because of the moon crescents uh, on his hello. Oops. Yeah. It has been uh, tentatively identified as Bodhisattva Chandra Prabha. But rather than appearing as a bodhisattva, he really looks like a Buddha, with urna, monk's robe, and no long hair, but adorned with an armlet and a large necklace with pendants, showing a, a mixed appearance of a necklace and a kamai, as in Bamiyan Bijiwal painting Im images. We're going to talk again of that. Another one with bare torso, here. Uh, appearing both as a bodhisattva and a Buddha, with a piece of cloth looking like a scarf and a pleated part on the shoulder as on early Kushana Buddha images from Mathura. Yeah. 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 Uh, is sitting on a throne supported by a dragon with tiger legs. Firstly identified as a shadow image from Nagarahara, Hada, it, ha it ha then has been recognized as a Maitreya image due to some features such as the Naga dragon supporting his throne, his flaming halo surrounded by celestial musicians and topped by a stupa, all of Chinese style. A third one in the pose of Marat Vijaya is wearing a crown with a three animal with a three, three animal headed figure and sitting on a throne supported by two dwarfish carrying figures. It has been identified either as Shakyamuni's image while gaining victory upon Mara from the Mahabodhi in Bodhgaya, or as an image of Ishvaraka known as a Bodhisattva, presumably from Khotan. This image remains enigmatic, but, but if it is the Maravijaya Buddha from Bodhgaya, the carrying Gana figures looking at the one and the ones in Ejinta Cave 26 probably refer to those on the Vajrasana, while the jewels manifest the glorious body of the Buddha, Sambhogakaya, at the moment of the body. As such, it might then have been, as Paul Mus proposed, the image that Swen Song could see when it was provided on special occasions, as attested by three Chinese inscriptions in Bodh Gaya, with crown, royal jewels, and golden threaded kashaya. But it could also represent, in a Buddhist docetism, a manifestation of Maitreya, both as a Bodhisattva, a Buddha, and a Chakravartin, just as Shakyamuni was. We know, for instance, that in Sri Lanka, Datu Sena, in the 6th century AD, is reported in the Chulavamsa to have bedecked a Maitreya image, image sorry, and appointed a guard to it. While in modern and Hinayana context, the Buddha image, uh, Prakeo Morakot in Bangkok, is offered by the king in the hot season, a royal attire of jewels. Indeed, Maitreya, despite his Brahmin origin, has early been associated with royal power. But in Theravadin and Mahayana context, and in his images as a Buddha, is also distinguished by his way of sitting in a royal pose. In pre-Mahayana sources, such as Mahavastu and Divyavadana, Maitreya is thus described as a Chakravartin ruler in one previous life. This royal character, devoted to Maitreya, appears in several sources such as the Chinese version of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra and the Sutra on Maitreya's great attainment of Buddhahood done there on earth. There, Shakyamuni gives his golden thread Kashaya to Kashyapa, Kashyapa with the duty to give it to Maitreya as a symbol of his mission and to testify to his Buddha status. So, when Maitreya will open the mountain where Kashyapa is waiting for him, Kashyapa will give him the royal garment endowing him with a Chakravartin Buddha status. 
In, in several other texts, such as Vibhasha and the Chinese translation of the Dharmapada and of the Samyutka Ratnapitaka Sutra, Shakyamuni refuses Mahapajapati's golden garment, but he suggests her to present it to the Sangha. None of the monks dare to accept it, except Netriya. Then Maitreya, clad in a golden robe, goes begging to Varanasi and follows Shakyamuni's prophecy, predicting that he will be the future Buddha. Considering material depictions, beside the example on the, beside the, example on the Dunhuang famous Buddhist image painting, there are several early examples where Maitreya is figured as a bejeweled Buddha or as a Bodhisattva, a princely figure with Buddha's character. Since Kushana rule, in Kushana and post-Kushana art from Mathura, Maitreya has been figured with a mixed appearance of a Buddha and a Bodhisattva. He may be shown either as a Bodhisattva, but with wet, webbed hands, Oops. Yeah. Um, curls of short hair and orna, Uh, the, uh, for instance, the one from Aichatra here, or as a Buddha, but wearing jewels and holding a vase at the one from Mathura and the one in the Musée Gimé, the other two ones. In the veranda of Cave 17 at, at in the veranda of Cave 17 at Ajanta, uh, found at uh, in, in 470, a painting Maitreya with Manushi Buddhas is figured as a bejeweled Buddha. He's sitting on a Vajrasana under his Bodhi tree and wears a three-pointed crown on his long hair, though he's cl clad with a monk's robe in the open mode, just as the Bodhisattva in monk's robe holding a Kamandalu uh, from Gimei. But if we admit that this image might be one of Maitreya, what would be then its contextual meaning? In Central Asia, the association in an iconographic pattern of Bodhisattva Maitreya with Shakyamuni's Parinirvana, future Buddha Maitreya and th Thousand Buddhas, has been pointed out in Kizil Cave 80, uh, in Dunhuang Cave 254, and in Kakrak and Bamiyan, uh, as an illustration of sutras of Maitreya and a visualiza visualization support to those aiming at being reborn after Shakyamuni's Parinirvana in Maitreya's Tushita heaven in order to have the opportunity to follow Maitreya on his descent on earth and to listen to his preaching and to reach, thus reach Nirvana. There, Maitreya Buddha appears sitting among the thousand Buddhas on the side walls of the caves, at the crowned Buddha wearing a kamai. Here. And holding a gnome's ball. It thus would be Maitreya descending on earth to preach Shakyamuni's law as the first of the 996 next Buddhas with a total of 1,000 Buddhas, including the four past one of the same cosmic era. The, associ the association of Bodhisattva Maitreya with Parinirvana. Oops. I don't have the, the picture of the Parinirvana. <laughs> um, the Parinirvana is focusing on Maitreya's role as a mediator and keeper of the Buddhist law after Shakyamuni's death, symbolized by Shakyamuni's bow, which is said to have been transported in many places, including Vaishali, Gandhara, Khotan, and Kucha, then in Tuchita heaven, where Maitreya paid homage to it during a week before being taken away in the Naga world. At the moment of Maitreya's descent, the four bowls are expected to be offered again to Maitreya by the four Lokapalas, as in the time in Shak of Shakyamuni. So, according to this, we may surmise that Maitreya might have been represented in Dunhuang, just as elsewhere in Central Asia, not only as a Bodhisattva or a Buddha, but also as a bejeweled Buddha, or even as a crowned bodhisattvas in monk's robe, just as on the two banners uh, from Dunhuang, Captain Guimet. 
The issue then is, why are there virtually no Dunhuang banners figuring Bodhisattva Maitreya while there are so many depictions of him in excavated Buddhist sites in Yunkang, Longmen, Dunhuang, and on paintings from Central Asia, that is Bami and Kakret, Kizil, Torfan, Fandukistan, Murtuk, and later on from Kocho and Karakoto. Interestingly, <clears throat> interestingly, the Maitreya figure on a double-sided banner from Murtuk is depicted over a female Atlant figure, reminding the earth deity Prithivi, supporting Vaishravana as figured in cotton. This is a testimony of the closeness of the two figures, both popular in cotton, cotton, as we know through several sources, religious records from cotton, annals of the kingdom of Lee, the prophecy concerning Lee. That Maitreya is said to have been born there twice, as the ruler of the kingdom, first as, as Vijaya Sambhava, uh, and then as Vijaya Varya. But there is only one known inscribed de depiction of Bodhisattva Maitreya on a banner from Dunhuang. It is a hand banner in National Museum. Sorry, it is a hem banner uh, in National Museum of New Delhi. Maitreya Bodhisattva is shown there as a mere Bodhisattva with only a particular crown, not very clear, but certainly differing from typical Bodhisattva diadems with roundels and lotuses. That this banner appears quite isolated might simply signify that Maitreya cults, popular in China all, th all through Sui and early Tang dynasties, since the translation of the Lotus Sutra and especially after the translations in Chinese of the Sutra on meditation on the ascent and rebirth of, of Maitre in Maitreya Bodhisattva's Tushita Heaven uh, in 40 455, and then of the sutras on Maitreya descent and birth down there as Buddha, by Dharmaracha and then by Kumarajiva were no more important from high Tang period onward. But, as it has been pointed out, early pointed out, cults to Maitreya did not stop in the 7th century to be surpassed. Sorry to be superseded uh, by Amitabha and Pure Land cults as proved material testimonies as well as the new translation by Yiting in 701 of the Maitreya Vyakarana, Mili um, Lai Jing, and the Sutra on Maitreya's descent and rebirth down there on earth. Indeed, Maitreya cults were still practiced in Mogaoku all along Tang and five dynasties, and even up to Song dynasties, and were presumably quite popular, apart from the huge images Maitreya Buddha in caves 96 and 130, owing to the revitalization of the Maitreya cult by Empress Wu. It has been reckoned that among all the paintings in Mogaoku, illustrations of the sutra on Maitreya's descent and rebirth down there on earth were in the third rank after illustrations of Amitabha and Vaishajyaguru sutra. To cite, oh, skip. Even after the occupation of Dunhuang by the Tibetans, it has been pointed out that Maitreya sutras are still frequently illustrated, either on one of the slopes of the ceiling, ceiling as in cave 85 and 9, late Tang, early Thong, or else on the south walls next to the illustration of Amitabha Sutra. And as late as the Song dynasty, Cave 55 has a shrine that bears three monumental groups of Maitreya preaching to the three assemblies. There are also a few Dunhuang portable paintings dating from the 9th to 10th centuries, echoing the paintings in the caves, which depict, depict Maitreya as the future Buddha preaching to one of his three assemblies in Ketuma. What happens? In Ketumati, such as in the Stein collection painting 11, or Stein painting in the British Museum with the canopy clouds ridden by absurdities, scattering blossoms, a characteristic of Maitreya's preaching in Ketumati. The doubt may remain concerning several preaching scenes that could be either Shakyamuni's or Maitreya's, or maybe both, representing Shakyamuni um, 
or Maitreya, and showing, as Poma suggested, a constant type of the earthly Buddha, whose venue is periodical, that we have known, and which we represent as Shakyamuni, but that we await as Maitreya, and a manifestation of the everlasting Chakravartin sitting on the same throne, sitting on the same throne with lions and bejeweled in the same way, sometimes. Stein painting 41. Yeah. Stein painting for 41 from the five dynasty, dynasties, 939, shows Maitreya holding the Ohm's bowl, as in Maitreya's image is signaled by Miyagi in Bamiyan Valley. It might give a clue to the identifi identification of the somehow enigmatic painting on paper from Paleo Collection showing a Bodhisattva in monk's robe holding a bow. This figure looks like a Bodhisattva with hair tied in bun and three section crown. But deprived of long locks on the shoulders, he's holding a bow and a stalk looking like a feathered fan. It has tentatively been identified as Baisha Jagur, the medicine Buddha. But Baisha Jagur is generally represented holding a kakara and a bowl and without a crown. The bowl might then merely be the Buddha Om's bowl and the symbolic sign of the transmission of the Dharma. But this painting is clumsy, we may recognize, and may have been painted by someone not so aware of the iconographic prescriptions. So the paucity of Maitreya figures on Mogao ban banners might further signify that there, in the late Tang period, Maitreya could not be so much a secondary or a accompanying figure, as we may infer from the use of banners. Unlike Im images painted in Mogao caves, figures on Dunhuang banners are isolated from any lit liturgical context, which would help in giving clues for their identification. We may surmise that they were used as elsewhere in Buddhist context, most probably accompanying other religious items, either statues or other portable, portable paintings, or both. They are reported in sutras such as the Buddha named Sutra to have decorated meditation cells together with flowers, painting, and an image of the Buddha. So we may wonder whether banners with Maitreya might have been paired or not with banners figuring other bodhisattva, possibly Manjushri, Wenshu, or even Kshitigarbha Ditsang and accompanied larger portable paintings as assisting figures. The pairing of Maitreya with Kshitigarbha, Ditsang, could be suggested, since they were both associated in Chinese Buddhism with teachings of the decline of Buddhism, and Ditsang worship was linked to the cult of Maitreya as it as has been evidenced by Jiru through some archaeological pieces, such as a stele dedicated in 670, and through popular narratives. Here the stele, here the stele, with on this side Maitreya, and on this side Ditsang. The popular narrative, the story induced that as devotion to Ditsang may bring rebirth into Shita heaven, or as Ditsang may, may be a guide who ex escorts the dead to Tushita heaven, Maitreya himself leads the dying to his own abode, according to the sutra on contemplating the, descent, the essence sorry, to Maitreya Bodhisattva's Tushita heaven, just as Yin Lu leads the dead to Amitabha's pure land. Would it, would it be possible then that guiding Maitreya would be depicted thus as a crown monk, just as this, this song is portrayed as a monk holding the six string and wish granting jewels? So I go back to the beginning. But among the plentiful Bodhisattva images in the Mogao cave, either painted 
in or below sutra illustrations or sculpted among the main sculpted groups, no image of Bodhisattva Maitreya has been surely identified. Well, not precisely, except on northern wall, northern wall of cave 329. Whoops. Here. I'm sorry for the picture, it's not very good. Except on the wall, cave, uh, the wall of cave 329, combining two different sutras in one scene, where Maitreya is shown twice, seated in Bhadrasana, both as an enlightened Buddha in Ketumati, and as a Bodhisattva, uh, awaiting his rebirth in Tushita heaven. There, he's depicted as a bejeweled Buddha, or rather, as a Bodhisattva with crown and monk's robe just at the one from Ajanta and the one on the banners. This might give a further argument to identify the bodhisattvas in monk's robe on banners in Musée Guimet and BNF as possible figures of Maitreya. But of course, it's only a proposal. Thank you for your attention. It's 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 not your fault at all. Thank you so much. Go very I went very fast. I hope it's okay. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Natalie, for this wonderful paper and for your patience especially. You may have uh, seen that we have some technical problems here, and I really admi ad admire her. It's so difficult to stand here as a speaker, nervous anyway, in front of an audience in such a great hall, and uh, still keep concentrated on your paper. And it was a very intensive look at the Maitreya iconography. Thank you so much for that. So I think they are trying to fix this now. And I may uh, uh, possibly inter uh, introduce our next speaker, who is also, has also come to us from Paris, um, uh, this time from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And her name is Nathalie Monet. She is the curator of the Peliot Dunhuang Manuscript and Chinese Rare Book Collections at the Bibliothèque. And may I? ask her to come to the podium, please. Among the um, illustrated scrolls from Dunhuang, known shows more pictorial diversity than manuscript 4524, um, which was already um, introduced to you by Professor Victor Mayer yesterday. Uh, it depicts the magic competition between Shariputra, one of the closest disciples of the Buddha, and Radharaksha, the master of a sect uh, considered heretical by the Buddhists. The story takes a, as its starting point a dispute about the construction of a Buddhist monastery in an Indian kingdom at the time of the Buddha. The opponents of Buddhism are against the project, and it is decided that the two parties will fight it out in a contest supervised by the king. Each opponent uses his magic powers to invoke natural phenomena and powerful beasts in order to show his superiority. The story was told by monks in Khotan on the Silk Road as early as the mid-5th century, 
some four or five centuries before um, the present scroll. It became popular in Dunhuang and circulated through texts, oral performances, images on silk and on paper scrolls, and was depicted on large frescoes. To illustrate the episodes of this Buddhist story, painters had to create entirely new scenes or draw their inspiration from existing models. In the process, they could use motifs unrelated to Buddhism, empty them of their original meaning, and infuse them with a new message. I will focus on the central image of the second scene to show that the Dunhuang painter relied on an elaborate pre-existing model which explains its remarkable pictorial quality. The scene depicts the combat between a bull and a lion, the two most powerful beasts of the ancient world. The fascinating clash of these two symbols of power gave rise to a full range of stories and artistic interpretations around the world. It has often been represented since antiquity and appears in the Middle East, in Central Asia and in China, as well as in the Mediterranean world. In the particular context of this story, the lion represents the Buddhists, or Shariputra himself, or even the Buddha, and the buffalo represents his opponents. The lion, the lion has long been associated with Buddhism. In the scroll, it appears as a typical Chinese lion, comparable to other lions like the one on the left of this slide from a 9th century Dunhuang painting. Both lions have the same round face, the same wide open mouth, the same curly and abandoned mane, etc. The first to leap into the arena for the second round of the contest is a wondrous water buffalo, which the text describes as really impressive. In the drawing, however, the buffalo is not shown as an imposing beast but as a completely dominated victim. The value of this image doesn't lie in each individual beast, but in the combination of the two. In fact, it must be considered as one single image of two beasts intertwined together in a struggle. This image belongs to the category described by art historians as a symplegma. The lion is attacking from behind. It has thrown its weight onto the buffalo and has pinned it to the ground. In contrast to the lion bursting with energy, the buffalo looks, looks inert and seems to passively accept its tragic fate. The powerful beast is not defending itself. Curiously, it doesn't even seem to be suffering. One of its strong legs is extended while the other is folded under him. The attacking lion maintains one paw on the spine of its prey while biting its rump. Although the story depicts a magic contest of supernatural powers, blood is spilled to the ground as if the combat were a real one. This vivid detail is not in the text which specifies that the buffalo soon dissolved even its bones were devoured so that the buffalo completely disappeared. Um, the details are worth, worth observing as they are proof that the image was not created by the painter of the scroll or his predecessor. The image has, in fact, a very long artistic history. The symbolism of the fight between a bull and a lion can be traced back to Mesopotamia six millennia ago but its early meaning remains speculative. A wide range of explanations have been suggested. One scholar mapped out the constellations as they were seen in, the, in that part of the world on February 10, 4000 BCE, in order to show the position of the constellations Taurus, represented as a bull, and Leo as a lion. At the time of the spring equinox, 
Taurus disappears and is replaced by Leo. Using fauna as symbols, the phenomenon is represented by the victory of the lion over the bull. In ancient Mesopotamia, the motif of a lion slaying a bull would not only symbolize the spring equinox, but also signal the beginning of the agricultural year. This attractive interpretation is not, however, shared by all scholars. Here is an early representation of a lion attacking a bull. It is on a Sumerian goblet discovered in the territory of ancient Sumer, dating from the 13th century BCE. Later images are more numerous, like this silver and gold vessel from Mesopotamia in the shape of a bull attacked by a lion. It dates back to the 7th or 6th century BCE. The manner in which the lion attacks its opponent is quite similar to the Dunhuang scroll, and so is the position of the forelegs of the victim, although in a mirror image. The same attitude of tr tranquil resignation characterizes the face of the bull. This expression becomes understandable and is totally appropriate if we consider that it represents a cyclical phenomenon, an inevitable astronomical event that takes place annually and announces the coming spring. To emphasize the willingness of the bull to be put to death, underlines the harmonious replacement of the seasons. The battle between the lion and the bull gradually acquired a distinct political meaning. The motif made the powerful lion a symbol of ruling power. This monumental sculpture in low relief was discovered on the wall of a staircase leading to a 6th century BCE palace in Persepolis. According to one interpretation, which sees the lion and bull as signs of the zodiac, this combination represented the annual New Year's festival performed within the city. More recently, a new political interpretation has been suggested. It would not only represent a great power, being overcome by yet greater power, but it would illu illustrate, <clears throat> illustrate King Darius's personal political vision of his empire. This large silver plate from Iran shows how the same motif has been transmitted by means of portable objects. Many other tentative meanings have been put forward. The combat has also been interpreted as symbolizing the cycle of life and death, or the astronomical phenomena of day and night, the lion being the sun and the bull the moon. Uh, this potent Near Eastern motif has circulated on seals, coins, and other artifacts. It has also appealed to artists in Greco-Roman antiquity, who adapted the design to their specific needs for images. They substituted other animals, but retained the shape of the symplegma. I cannot resist mentioning the Greek sculpture from the Musei Capit Capitolini in Rome that was exhibited a few years ago at the Getty Villa. It portrays a lion attacking a horse from the fourth century BCE. Uh, for the extraordinary fate of this culture and its successive meanings, there is an ex excellent summary on the Getty website. Um, there are several other examples from Greece, like this piece dating back to 200 BCE. There is again the Roman mosaic that is currently on display at the Getty Villa. It dates from the middle of the second century CE and was discovered in Tunisia. It reinterprets the same motif with the bull being replaced by an uh, onager, which may have better suited the artist's iconographic agenda. As in the Dunhuang manuscript, the blood flows from the attacked animal's spine to the ground. 
In two mosaic panels from the middle of the 4th century CE, we find the same image, uh, same combat image, except that the lion has been replaced by a tiger which attacks a bovine, here identified as a calf. The position of the tiger is rather similar with its paw on the spine of the victim. The vanquished animal has a folded foreleg and shows the same passivity. The discovery of two mirror images confirms that the motif could be used on either side. Many examples show the lion attacking the bull from the right, but in some cases it comes from the left. Uh, this is precisely the case in the Dunhuang frescoes of caves 9, 146, and 196. This small object from China bears more resemblance to our symplegma. It is a matte weight in bronze inlaid with gold, silver, agate, and turquoise from the Warring States period or Western Han Dynasty. A much closer image in time and space can be found in the tomb of a man called Yu Hong, who died in uh, 592 CE in Shanxi province. He was probably from Central Asia and served from, for some time as a Chinese ambassador to Persia. He also served as a Sabao, a title given to the supervisor of foreigners living in China. One panel of his stone sarcophagus was decorated with an almost identical motif to the one on the Dunhuang scroll. The precise symbolism of this image is not understood. Yu Hong had perhaps ordered this exotic image because it belonged to a de decorative repertoire related to his life in Central Asia and relevant to his high status of Sabao. Four centuries later, the inspiration for the image on the Dunhuang scroll must have probably come again from Central Asia. It is likely that the painter of the Dunhuang scroll copied the motif from an existing painting, sketchbook, or from some other artifact unrelated to Buddhism. Since it suited the story rather well, he used the age-old symplegma to symbolize the victory of Buddhism over its enemies. To my knowledge, the symplegma was not used at later periods in China for other purposes than the illustration of the magic combat. But it continued to circulate in Central Asia and especially in the Arab Persian world. One of the great illustrated books of the Arab Persian world is a collection of fables about the adventures of two jackals, Kalila and Dimna. It is one of the earliest and greatest classics in Arabic prose literature. Originally, it is a collection of Indian fables written in Sanskrit, translated into Persian and Syriac, and later Arabic. The first chapter tells the story of the broken friendship between the Lion King and a bull. One jackal introduces the bull at court, and the Lion King befriends him. Filled with jealousy, the jackal persuades the king that the bull intends to betray and attack him. The furious lion then kills his innocent friend. The scene of the fight is usually illustrated in a manner very similar to that of the Dunhuang manuscript. Along with the tale, the fixed iconography circulated throughout Central Asia, Persia, Syria, Egypt, and other regions we see a fairly basic representation of the fight on this manuscript from the late 14th century. It is nevertheless in line with our model, the bull and the lion being in the same position and having similar features. There's even the detail of the blood flowing from the bull's back. A manuscript uh, illustrated in 1310 in Egypt has an even more simplified rendition of the battle. The image on your left comes from the oldest illustrated manuscript of this tale in the Arab world. The model has been slightly modified. 
Here, the Lion King takes hold of its victim with three of its legs, while the bull bends not one but two of its legs under the crushing weight to show the overwhelming power of the victorious Lion King and the entire submission of the bull. This model spread through the Arab world for a long time, as seen on the image on your right from the 16th or 17th century manuscript from Egypt. Here is an innovative bird's eye view of our motif. It doesn't, however, alter the details that characterize the symplegma. I will end with Susini, an Italian artist who molded bronze sculptures, sometimes of a lion attacking a bull, sometimes of a lion attacking a horse, as seen here, uh, um, in a piece also from the Getty collection. In the context of Florence, this motif was ne neither astronomical nor an insignia of royal power. Neither was it a representation of exotic hunts or the illustration of an episode of a magic religious contest. And it was certainly not about a mortal combat between two friends. It simply served to support a new aesthetic in line with the Baroque spirit of the 17th century. The most striking difference is that the victim refuses to accept its fate. It seems to us to bring a more modern approach to the theme. The animal tries desperately to fight back. It shows intense suffering and rebels against its destiny. Its mouth wide open, the animal refuses to die silently. At first sight, we think that this rendering is more realistic than the drawing on the Dunhuang scroll. But when we observe the details more closely, we discover that the two images share very similar artistic conventions. This fascinating motif of the deadly combat between a lion and a bovine traveled widely from Mesopotamia, circa the fourth millennium BCE, to the Italy of the Baroque period and throughout most of the Eurasian continent. The form of this ready-made image remained almost unchanged through the ages while its meaning changed unceasingly. The textual content of the Dunhuang scroll has been widely studied by Professor Victor Mayer, who has shown its complexity. I hope to have shown that the scroll's iconography is no less complex. The Getty Villa um, owns several artifacts decorated with the symplegma, and I'm happy to have, had it, to have had the opportunity to show a few more examples from China and the Middle East. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalie, for this very interesting paper, taking us over through space and time. And I was especially intrigued by the changes of meaning, which uh, cautions us art historians never to um, associate an image too closely with just one symbolism, obviously. Um, I may now, as our uh, last speaker, introduce a colleague of mine from UCLA, uh, uh, Richard von Glan, who teaches Chinese and world history uh, with a focus on economic history, and therefore he'll talk about, uh, for us about, talk to us, I'm not a native speaker, I'm sorry, um, talk to us about money and the Silk Road economy. Please welcome Professor von Glan. Uh, I'm something of an interloper here, uh, not just because I'm an economic historian rather than an art historian, uh, but also because I have a very, my, my talk will touch only a little bit on Dunhuang, uh, but rather speak to the wider context uh, of the Silk Road world, uh, and 
which of course uh, Dun Huang was uh, a very crucial part. Uh, money was indispensable to the rise of Silk Road trade, but the kinds of money used to facilitate trade over the long history of Silk Road commerce repeatedly changed with the ebb and flow of political and commercial currents. Uh, an abiding feature of Silk Road commerce was the absence of any single common currency in continuous use uh, from China in the East uh, to India and Iran in the West. Uh, again, to situate you uh, geographically, uh, is this okay. Uh, here's Dun Huang, of course. Uh, the, in the early centuries of the Silk Road uh, trade, uh, traders favored the southern route uh, from Dun Huang to Lolan, Nia, Khotan, uh, and then to uh, Bactria uh, and, and down into um, India and the and Arabian Sea. In uh, the later centuries, by the Tang Dynasty, the northern route had become uh, dominant, again, going from Dunhuang uh, up to Turfan, uh, Khotan. Uh, Samarkand here was the uh, home of the Sogdian merchants who were the dominant traders all throughout the Silk Road, uh, not just out here in the west, uh, but all the way to the Tang capital of Chang'an, uh, where there was a very large uh, Sogdian uh, community. Uh, coined money was first introduced to Central Asia by military garrisons established by the Han Empire. Uh, as Professor Rung mentioned this morning, uh, the Han Emperor Wu, uh, after his conquests in the Gansu Corridor, uh, established permanent garrisons of Chinese soldiers uh, to defend the Han against the Xiongnu uh, nomads, uh, Dun Huang, of course, being one of those. Uh, another was uh, Ju Yen uh, up here, from which we have a very large cache of documents uh, dating back to the Han Dynasty beginning in 119 BCE. Uh, and they contain uh, numerous records of uh, salary entitlements and payments uh, to the soldiers who were paid in coin that was shipped uh, to uh, Ju Yen uh, from uh, the Han uh, capital. Uh, we also have bookkeeping accounts and includes lots of data on prices for grain, land, clothing, and so forth. Uh, a lot of evidence for buying on credit uh, and the like. Uh, these coins then were not used for trade purposes so much, or at least not for international trade, uh, but rather to pay soldiers and they in turn used it for their uh, living uh, expenses. Uh, we find these coins uh, extending out uh, <clears throat> westward, uh, however, as far uh, to Lolan, uh, to, to Khotan, uh, but uh, not oddly enough uh, in um, Nia. <clears throat> uh, this is the typical uh, Han uh, coinage, the Wuzhu coin, uh, which uh, has the classic uh, structure of the round coin with the square hole in the center. Local coinages appeared in, the, uh, in Central Asia in the first century uh, CE, uh, <clears throat> beginning uh, with uh, Kushan. Uh, again, the, uh, I don't know if Kushan really deserved the title of the empire. Uh, it's centered here in Bactria and Gandhara, uh, but it did provide the uh, crucial link that created uh, Silk Road commerce. Uh, the Kushan, the uh, nomad uh, overlords of this region uh, <clears throat> connected the overland uh, oasis towns in Central Asia uh, with India and then, uh, as you can see, and eventually to the Arabian Sea uh, and uh, over to uh, Roman Egypt. Uh, so it's really with the Kushan that we can begin to speak of Silk Road uh, commerce. Uh, the Kushan themselves began to issue coins in the early first century uh, CE, uh, <clears throat> bronze coins uh, initially, and then uh, in the early second century, uh, gold coins as well. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, Kushan coinage was very much in the uh, Indo-Hellenic uh, style. 
They are bilingual coins uh, in Greek and uh, Karasthi. Uh, the Karasthi script is derived from Aramaic, which was the official written language of the Persian Empire. It was adopted by the Kushan rulers uh, for their own uh, texts uh, as well. Uh, the Kushan bronze coins that you see at the top there uh, did circulate into Central Asia. We find them at Khotan uh, and at Lolan, uh, but the gold coins uh, never uh, seem to have uh, entered into the uh, eastern steppe. They're only found in the uh, Bactria, uh, Gandhara region and uh, southward in what's now uh, Pakistan. The other place where we find uh, early local coinage in roughly about the same time, early first century CE, is in Khotan. <clears throat> uh, and these coins are quite interesting. They're also uh, bilingual, uh, using Karasthi uh, for, uh, uh, on this side, uh, giving the uh, name of the Khotanese uh, king, uh, <clears throat> again, using the Prakrit language, but the Karasthi script. Uh, who is heralded in Persian style as king of kings. Uh, on the reverse, we have the weight of, or value, I should say, uh, of the coin in, uh, rendered in Chinese uh, terms. Uh, and there's a Chinese inscription here that's circular, Tong Qian Zhong Nian Si Zhu. And the coin itself is uh, entirely, uh, uh, again, in, in the sort of Indo-Greek uh, uh, style of construction. It's, uh, it's struck, it obviously doesn't have the square hole like Chinese coins. So the only Chinese element of this is the Chinese inscription. Uh, these coins did not really circulate uh, beyond Khotan itself. So they were really used as a local currency, but it shows that the uh, merchants and people uh, living there needed to uh, interact with both the Chinese uh, and the um, uh, uh, Kushan uh, monetary systems, uh, had to reckon in both Kushan and, and Han currencies. Uh, after the fall of the Han dynasty in the early 3rd century CE, uh, coinage really begins uh, to disappear from uh, the trade networks of the uh, Silk Road and is replaced with uh, commodity monies from the third to the sixth century. Uh, for example, the Karasti documents we have from Nia from the third and fourth centuries record uh, many transactions and land and slaves and livestock. Uh, they use measures of grain as the unit of account. Uh, slave prices were given in camels uh, sometimes in carpets. Uh, taxes were paid in various kinds of commodities, including camels, wine, and uh, textiles. Uh, and certainly silk itself uh, served as probably the principal money for long distance trade uh, during these uh, centuries, the period of disunion uh, in China. Uh, this is a bolt of silk uh, from uh, Lolan uh, that was used uh, as money uh, it's, uh, the image is a little bit uh, misleading. The, uh, the check pattern is, is not on the silk. That's just a uh, problem with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the scanning. Uh, so it's just plain uh, white silk with no design. So this plain silk was used uh, as a common currency in the third to sixth centuries, especially when there was no uh, coinage circulating in this region. But in the sixth century, with the restoration of imperial states on both ends of the Silk Road, the Sasanid Empire in Iran, and the Suiyantang Empires in China, coin once again begins to flow into Central Asia, uh, including the uh, <coughs> Sasanid uh, silver drachma and the Byzantine gold uh, solidi, <coughs> which circulated as far east as Turfan. Uh, the Gaochang Kingdom at Turfan, founded uh, in the beginning of the 6th century, uh, was a multi-ethnic town, about 40,000 in population. Uh, most of its uh, residents were of uh, Chinese descent. The long-distance traders were Sogdians from the region uh, of Samarkand. They very much dominated the long-distance trade. 
But we have lots of documents from Turfan in this period, 6th and 7th centuries, that show that the local uh, herders and uh, farmers were very much drawn into a monetary economy, uh, one that was based on uh, silver. <clears throat> uh, and the silver coinage of uh, Sassanid uh, Iran was brought to this region uh, through uh, uh, Sogdian merchants. Uh, by the end of the 6th century, virtually all the loan contracts that we have from Turfan are denominated in silver coins. Uh, land sales, half the time they use silver coins, half the time uh, units of grain, hired labor was paid in these coins uh, as uh, well. Uh, <clears throat> again, we have an example of a, uh, just a contract uh, for a uh, relatively short-term uh, loan. Uh, to cover the cost of spring planting uh, that was uh, made in, uh, in coins. Uh, nearly all the surviving contracts uh, that we have uh, uh, from Turfan are in Chinese, uh, and uh, they very much reflect the local economy, not the long-distance trade. We don't really have uh, written evidence of uh, the long-distance trade, but clearly this uh, foreign currency from Iran had become the, the basic local currency as well. Uh, Byzantine gold coins had become the dominant currency of the Mediterranean world. Uh, in China, we've only found Byzantine coins in elite tombs. Uh, <clears throat> this example from the tomb of uh, Tianhong, uh, a general of the Northern Zhou uh, dynasty who died in 576. Uh, his tomb is in uh, Guyuan, which is along the road uh, leading from uh, Dunhuang into uh, the Chinese capital. There were five uh, of these gold coins discovered in his tomb. They were not really used as money, however. Uh, they probably arrived as gifts from the Turkish Khans to uh, rulers in China. As you can see, the coin is punched with holes. It was worn on clothing as decoration rather than being used uh, as uh, money. Uh, we do have some references in text uh, to gold coins as well. Uh, this is a tomb inventory, uh, but uh, <clears throat> clearly uh, they did not deposit uh, 20,000 gold and silver coins uh, in the tomb. This is really uh, a ritual testament of value, uh, not referring to, to actual coins. So the gold coins, uh, to the extent we find them at all uh, in the Chinese world, were merely decorative rather than being used as currency. Uh, with the founding of the Tang Dynasty uh, in the early 7th century, the Tang introduced uh, an entirely new uh, coin, uh, the Kaiyuan uh, currency, <clears throat> Kaiyuan Tongbao. Uh, since the Han Dynasty, the various currency issued by rulers in China were always called Wuzhou coins, uh, which referred nominally to its weight, uh, but just became a, a signifier for uh, money. Uh, the Tang introduced uh, the Kaiyuan as the, actually the first currency that doesn't uh, specify its weight uh, in Chinese. Uh, that comes to Dis, uh, displaced the various Wuju coins uh, issued since the Han, uh, then in circulation. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as you can see, this is a coin actually from Kucha. Uh, there were copper mines in that region. The Tang set up a mint uh, there, and uh, the very reddish uh, uh, color of this coin is reflective of the local style of, of, of the local uh, uh, copper ores uh, of this region. Uh, the Kaiyuan coin uh, clearly had a powerful effect on uh, traders and was imitated widely uh, in Central Asia, uh, including in uh, Sogdi itself. Uh, these are, uh, this is a coin uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from summer, that was found in Samarkand, uh, which was issued by a local ruler there. Uh, and it's cl and clearly a, a, a carbon copy of the Tang Kaiyuan uh, coin. Uh, these coins, the, the Tang coinage, however, did not really, uh, at least initially, 
uh, penetrate into the Turfan region where these Sassanid silver coins uh, were still in uh, common use even after the Tang conquest of Turfan in 640. The locals still preferred to use their silver coins. Uh, after the Arab rulers, uh, after the Arabs conquered uh, the Sassanid Empire in 651, they continued to issue the same old coins, uh, 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 same style as the Sassanids. Uh, for a number of decades. <clears throat> uh, at the, in the 690s, the Islamic coinage undergoes, uh, throughout the Islamic world, a fundamental uh, reform in which they banish all images of rulers and replace uh, uh, those images with pure religious uh, texts, the Shahada, uh, the profession of faith, and, and so forth. And oddly enough, it's precisely at that moment that silver coinage disappears from Turfan as well. Roughly around uh, 700 or so, uh, the Tang Kayuan uh, coinage comes to uh, displace these uh, uh, Iranian uh, silver coins. Uh, silk, of course, uh, throughout this period is also being used for loans and uh, purchases. After the uh, outbreak of the Anushan Rebellion in the middle of the 8th century, which devastates the Tang Empire and leads to a withdrawal of the Tang military presence in Central Asia, uh, Tang coinage disappears from Central Asia as well. Indeed, coinage itself uh, disappears. Uh, during the Tibetan occupation of Dunhuang from 786 to 848, uh, Chinese coin uh, uh, ceases to circulate uh, in that region, and even after the restoration of uh, Chinese rule, not Tang rule, but Chinese rule in 848, uh, <coughs> coinage does not make any comeback uh, in Dunhuang itself. We have large numbers of contracts from Dunhuang from the 9th and 10th uh, centuries, uh, but none of them are denominated in coin. They're always in grain or silk. Uh, one effort to restore uh, coinage uh, after the Anlushan Rebellion uh, is mounted by uh, the Uyghur uh, Khans, uh, who established themselves at Turfan in the early 9th century in an attempt to uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> revive a, uh, a coinage in the Chinese uh, style. Uh, the Uyghurs were very closely allied uh, with the Sogdian merchants, the Uyghur Khan. Uh, converts to Manichaeanism, the, the Sogdian uh, religion, uh, and issued uh, these coins, uh, again, very much uh, in the Chinese style, although with uh, Uyghur uh, inscriptions. These, however, uh, were not issued in any large quantities. They don't seem to have made much of an impact in terms of really being used as money. Uh, they were more of a political statement, uh, an expression of the Uyghur Khan's sovereignty, uh, rather than uh, significant in any economic way. So uh, even in the highly commercialized world of the Silk Road, the circulation of money turns out to have been strongly localized. And the various kinds of coinage, again, we can see with the, especially the Tang Kaiyuan, its influence extending uh, all the way uh, to, uh, to Sagdi itself, but only for a fairly short uh, period. Uh, no coin or currency really dominates uh, throughout the whole uh, Silk Road route. Uh, <clears throat> local commerce was conducted with local currencies, uh, which may be coin, uh, more often uh, silk and other kinds of goods. Uh, the imperial currencies did not displace these local currencies, and this remains true even uh, in the era of the Mongol Khanates. Uh, they too were, were unable to establish a unified currency across uh, the Silk Road. Uh, so it turns out that the most versatile and long-lived currency of the Silk Road was, appropriate enough, uh, silk itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. This all reminded me a little bit of Europe before the Euro. Uh, <laughs> 
um, so, uh, and it, of course, it goes well with uh, what Susan Whitfield told us uh, before, uh, that the monks uh, traveled together with the merchants, and we only look at the same thing from different sides and from different disciplines, I think. Uh, may I ask the speakers to the podium now so we can have some questions and answers here? Thank you. We are a little bit uh, short of time, I'm afraid, so I was told we can only take three questions. Um, one is there. We have another one here. Okay, why don't you start? Hello, thank you very much for the very interesting talks this afternoon. Um, I noticed that uh, Susan Whitfield spoke earlier about the interregional movement of goods, surplus wealth, uh, to fund the construction of stupas and caves and their decoration. And I think we saw all of this being played out in all three of your talks. And my, my question is specifically for Valerie, and uh, it's about donors. I noticed in some of the Maitreya paintings there are some small figures which I thought might be uh, portraits of donors. And if they are, would those help identify the, um, the bodhisattvas in the pictures that you showed us? Oh. On the banners, uh, there were no, no donors. They're all alone, except on the uh, painting from the... Uh, Paleo collection in the BNF, and but that doesn't help because there's an inscription which is not uh, uh, helpful in identifying the Maitreya Millet. That's a problem because if there had been, uh, of course, inscriptions, <laughs> the question wouldn't have raised. So the problem is that there are much conjectures, of course. This is conjecture, because we don't have any inscriptions about that. And, and that's quite strange. That was, I was um, um, struck by this fact, that there were so many illustrations. I, of course, I didn't show everything. But there were so many illustrations of uh, Maitreya Sutras in, in uh, Mille Sutras in, in the Dunhong Mogao caves. And so few, uh, well, we have some Maitreya sutras on big banners, on, on big paintings, portable paintings, but almost no banners. And, uh, well, that was the, the point. It seems strange, so probably, well, that's my point. I think it, they haven't been identified yet. Maybe, maybe not. Because the other issue is maybe uh, I, I, I didn't have time to speak of that but those crown bodhisattvas in monk robe, in monk's robe maybe they might also be uh, some images of Dizong but it seems strange I think Maitreya would be much more fitting but there was another question here okay my question is for Professor Van Glan. Um, we saw a lot of different religions referenced or represented on the coins, Silk Road religions. Um, conspicuously missing is Buddhism, of course. So I'm, if memory serves, there's some Kushan coinage with things that look like maybe could be Buddha icons on them. Do you see anything else, um, in the, particularly in the Donghuang, Xinjiang region, that might associate currency with um, Buddhism? If not coins, then perhaps in the contracts or anything like that? Uh, it, well, as you say, uh, not that particular one that I showed, but, but uh, some of the uh, Kushan coins uh, does uh, show images of uh, Buddhism and the Kushan themselves, of course, uh, converted uh, uh, to Buddhism, or, or at least became sponsors of Buddhism. They, they seem to actually been fairly eclectic in their uh, religious uh, preferences, but Buddhism was included among those that they were patronizing uh, and that do appear on their coinage. Uh, but uh, I would say I don't see any Buddhist motifs on any other uh, currency, outside of India itself, of course. Uh, 
um, but not in any of the Central Asian ones. And of course, the Chinese uh, are non-iconic. Uh, they have script, but no images. Uh, and that becomes the, uh, the pattern for uh, the Islamic coinage after, after the 690s. And very interesting to see how quickly the Sasanic coinage disappears once that uh, uh, reform takes place, and uh, the Islamic coins themselves uh, also don't seem to have uh, traveled into uh, uh, the Silk Road uh, once they start issuing them. And maybe another question. Yes, over there. What is the difference between a banner and a portable painting, and how were they? displayed or used? Yeah. It's a question of, of format uh, the, and, and probably the use of it because the portable painting is, sh should be a big one and the mounting is not the same. The banner has uh, a, a very long format. Uh, it's a long piece, um, probably uh, worn on a, on a stiff or in something a hump, something very long. Uh, probably uh, as in other Buddhist uh, um, contexts, were on processions, as you as you can see in Buddhist some Buddhist countries and Hinayanist Buddhist countries now, they are just uh, taken on processions with a statue, and the, the monks bear the banners. So the banners are um, uh, moved, while the the portable paintings. Well, we, we, it's all, all so conjectures, of course, but as if we can uh, um, probably, well, if we can uh, have an idea about the Tibetan usage, you know, the big paintings were hanging uh, down in front of the monasteries. So probably the, the, hanging, the portable paintings, which, which are often much bigger than the banners, much larger, uh, were simply just hung, probably, and not uh, conveyed, but they ha don't have the same uh, mounting. This is the principal difference. The banners ha almost always have a, a three-parted or four-parted mountings with a, a piece which is a, a kind of a head, a triangular form. Uh, which is said to be the head, and some ribbons on the sides uh, and on the bottom uh, with stiffener. So the ribbons are um, sometimes called the, the, the legs and the arms of the banner. So this is a principal difference because they are uh, supposed to move in the air, you know, to have while the, the portable paintings are, they have a mounting, but it, they're stiff. Well, they're supposed to stay and, and not to move in the air. And moreover, the banners, well, many of the banners are double-sided. Um, on, on silk, they are double-sided, but also on hemp, as one example was showed, they were painted on both sides. So they were uh, uh, used to be seen on both sides. So to be transported, probably. Well, this is my point, but I think this should be it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, I saw another hand raised on the other side of the stair. I think maybe we can allow just one more question. In the uh, video at the Getty Research Institute, there's a reference to Kuan Yin as male, whereas all the Japanese sculptures I've seen of Kuan Yin are female, and I've only seen ch Chinese sculptures of Kuan Yin as female as well. So I was kind of confused by that. Is Kuan Yin the first transgendered goddess that we... Uh... <laughs> 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 probably. Excuse me, I, I may probably answer that. I have an, uh, my, not my advisor, but the advisor of my advisor at Heidelberg University, uh, Professor Zeckel, he insisted that uh, these enlightened uh, Buddhist figures are neither nor, and of course, they are beyond. Uh, and he always insisted that Guan Yin is male, whether Chinese, Japanese, or anything. But I think there are some local cults uh, where, you know, local um, 
deities come in and, and then there may be some gender issues. But uh, I'm not a Buddhist <laughs> specialist, but uh, that's what I've learned and maybe some other Buddhist specialists can answer to that too. Sometimes uh, it's it's admitted that uh, Guanin becomes uh, rather feminine in the song period after the song from the song period and before it's still be ambivalent, you know, because it, he looks or she looks uh, very feminine, but with mustache, mustaches. But it's the appearance. It's but it's the appearance. Not, not yeah, the meaning. Not the, the meaning. The, the, the meaning is the a deity. Yeah. Is is just as the Buddha who is. Uh, uh, represented without sex uh, at, at some time. So it's the same thing. Well, thank you all very much, and I think we have to move on to the next panel. Thank you. And thanks to our speakers as well.